morning and welcome everyone. I'm Margaret Smith and this is Maggie Whitaker. All of us at Southern Tier Lyme Support are excited to be with us today. We would like to thank Dr. Garudo, Amanda Rue, and Binghamton University for co-sponsoring our fourth annual Lyme Disease Conference. This year we'd also like to thank Upstate Medical for working with us to bring CME credits for MDs and DOs. Uh, our organization <coughs> continues to grow in the Southern Tier region, spreading awareness and providing much needed support. We would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsors and donors and to thank all of our volunteers, including our board of directors, our support group members, our community members, and Binghamton University students. So we have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you should have any questions or need any information, we do have volunteers that are designated in the Lion Green shirts. So please reach out to any of them and they will help you with whatever you need. At this time, we would ask that you would turn off your cell phones or, or put them on vibrate. If you should need the restrooms, there is a set of restrooms at the location of the entry to the left, off of room two, 2011, which is upstairs, and also above the cafe. If you would like to leave a question for a speaker, there are boxes at the Q&A table across from registration. And if you pre-ordered lunch, there will be a table right outside, right near the cafe where you can pick up your lunch starting at 11. We would also like to ask if you have an empty seat next to you to please slide over so that we can make room for others since we do have a full house today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ralph Peruto, who is a professor of biomedical anthropology at Binghamton University and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. Ralph Peruto. Thank you, Margaret, Maggie. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bhagat Samakia, who's Vice President for Research um, and the Binghamton University Research Foundation uh, for helping to co-sponsor this event uh, with Southern Tier Life Support Incorporated over the past four years. Both organizations, uh, of course, are committed to research excellence um, and online and other tick-borne illnesses and both um, to advancing uh, patient diagnostics uh, and effective uh, treatment, early effective treatment. I'll have more to say about that a, a little later at, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, well, uh, good morning everyone. It's great to be here to really share uh, our current research, uh, which has been ongoing now for uh, quite a number of years, um, starting back around 2011, and to talk to you about the epidemiology and the spread of uh, Lyme disease in our region, uh, and a problem that is certainly growing, I think as many of you know, um, and now affects some um, 14 states in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, uh, where one third U.S. population lives. Um, some of you, of course, are aware of the spatial distribution of Lyme disease uh, in, uh, in this growing problem. The CDC map that you see here, you'll probably see a couple of times uh, today. Uh, this is a 2015 map which highlights the problem. Uh, there's been really an exponential growth uh, in the incidence of Lyme disease, uh, certainly over the past 15 years. Lyme disease is not declining in uh, New York, and certainly not, it's exploding uh, uh, to our south in Pennsylvania, reaching an incidence that we see in New York, and more recently even surpassing uh, uh, New York State. Part of the increase may be due to increased recognition uh, in reporting by the medical community as well as by increases in the vector 
and reservoir flow support line, which I'll get into uh, shortly. They are the major players in, in terms of what happens uh, to the spread of the infectious agent. Well, if, we, if you look at the um, uh, chart that I have uh, uh, above me here, looking at the incidence rate per 100,000 population of human cases of Lyme disease in New York, I've highlighted three regions uh, that we're working in and uh, our regions that some of you may live in. Uh, as you can see in yellow, the southern tier is pretty high. Uh, with a crude rate uh, between 2013 and 2015, from which these figures come, of almost 100 cases, 97 cases per 100,000 population. Mohawk Valley comes in next in blue uh, with 66 or so, 67 cases, and the Finger Lakes um, in pink, that's around 18 or 19. And again, that's in that 2013 to 2015 time frame. If uh, one of the things that I want to point out, because some of you may say, well, it's not really bad in our region, but uh, uh, just uh, where my labor lives, uh, shortly, uh, just short ways down the road, it's uh, very significant. So this gives you kind of a frame of reference, by county at least, of the variability that we see in Lyme disease. So if we're working, Yeah. So, if that's hopefully better. Um, one of the things that we want to point out, if we're looking at the Southern Tier region, say Delaware County, we have uh, 69 cases per 100,000 population, while in Tioga it's 124. Uh, which leads the southern tier uh, region. Uh, these are these are pretty different, uh, but then we move over to Livingston County, and that has only about three cases per 100,000 population. So what I'm trying to show you here is that there's a great differential. This is just by county, but within a county, there's a significant difference from one area to another area, okay? And, and um, uh, Schuyler, for instance, has 125 cases per 100,000 population. Now, one of the things that, uh, that uh, we're concerned about um, is um, the um, uh, under-reporting of cases. This, uh, this is a significant part of the variability that we see. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, includes this spatial variability that I just talked about um, in the deer tick, in the reservoir host, the white-footed mouse, which I'll also talk about shortly, uh, from county to county and certainly within counties, but uh, there is also this under-reporting by the medical community because it is difficult to recognize its generalized symptomology, as a lot of you know, uh, but it also is recognition. And this takes time to get into the system where it's easily recognized by the medical community. All of these factors are influencing the variability that we wind up seeing. So, uh, transmission, uh, what happens during feeding? The bacteria lives in the gut of the tick, uh, many of you know, it's triggered. Um, the bacteria is triggered uh, to move when the tick starts ingesting blood, okay? So, uh, the bacteria migrate up out of the gut uh, into the saliva and then once the tick is feeding, of course, it inoculates you with the infectious agent or any warm-blooded animal it happens to be feeding on. So ticks feed pretty slowly, um, in the beginning uh, especially, so the process of infection takes a while. Now the general rule of thumb is 24 to 48 hours, but 
actual transmission of infection can occur within a 24-hour period. So it's important uh, that uh, you check for ticks after you come in from the out of doors. This slide shows the relative comparison of the life cycle stages of the deer tick. In fact, uh, Mandy Rome has at the table, the Binghamton University table, some ticks, and you ought to look at the different uh, stages, the life um, uh, cycle stages of the tick. The nymph uh, has, uh, uh, is small, the larva is much smaller than that. The larva has six legs, uh, nymph and adults have eight. But you get an idea of the size. I generally can't see a nymph with, uh, with my naked eye, and I usually have to hold a handheld uh, magnifying glass. Uh, students are much better than I am. They can see it with their naked eye. Well, a little bit about uh, co-infections. Because co-infections, we, we, we have uh, co-infections, as they're called. Uh, the black-legged tick can carry uh, a number of different human infectious uh, pathogens uh, and, a, and, and, and that can cause not just Lyme disease, but anaplasmosis, babesiosis, uh, Wasson virus disease, anaplasma, for instance, is extremely similar to Lyme. Uh, and obviously, if you're uh, checking for Lyme and uh, the test is negative. And the problem with testing early is you don't develop antibodies early enough. Uh, but when you do and it's negative, you need to check for various kinds of co-infections. Babesia uh, is a problem that uh, um, a parasite uh, uh, that uh, infects and destroys red blood cells and anemia can also occur as a result. There's Powassan virus as well, um, and um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Bartonella, all of these uh, potential infectious uh, problems occur with the black-legged uh, tick. Rocky Mountain is the dog tick, by the way. Not, not the black -legged. Well, a little bit beyond the background now is to give you a little bit of an update on some of our current research that involves the risk of Lyme in what we call fragmented ecologies uh, or uh, uh, built environments, areas uh, that um, uh, uh, form essentially the places where people work, live, and recreate on a regular basis. Our goal is really to determine uh, the extent of the prevalence of Lyme and other uh, 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 tick-borne uh, diseases in these physically fragmented little spaces um, within built environments, and to develop a predictive risk model uh, of transmission uh, of Lyme and, and other uh, tick-borne illnesses. Uh, by physically fragmented spaces, again, these are these broken up ecologies uh, man -made, within man-made structures, roads, housing areas, work areas, etc. So this kind of a landscape is, we feel, uh, probably among the highest, if not the highest, risk of infection. It's not an area where you might necessarily go uh, fishing or camping or hunting or spending your time. It's in your own backyard. And I'm going to give you some data that will exemplify some of the <coughs> kinds of problems that result uh, in neighborhoods, what we call the neighborhood project that uh, I'll talk about in just a minute. If um, I were to ask you, this is a, a slide uh, Mandy Rome presented uh, in, in, in other talks, where you might see the highest prevalence of uh, the Lyme pathogen and ticks uh, and or rodents, uh, you know, what, what area of the photo might you decide 
is the highest risk. That's the area, okay? The built environment area, that's the area that we're particularly concerned with. That's where you spend most of your time. So we work from a central hypothesis, uh, and that is that these fragmented eco spaces within built environments that have a lot of human activity or high human foot traffic um, are areas where contact of the infectious agent for, for Lyme uh, or other tick-borne illnesses is extraordinarily high. So the spread of Lyme really is a growing health concern. You heard very recently in the New York Times on uh, public radio um, and um, on CNN and other places um, uh, about the tick season, the upcoming tick season in the problem. So it's increasingly really, uh, receiving a lot more attention than it has a few years ago. The presence of infectious ticks, the reservoir host, uh, which I'll talk about in associated environmental variables. We, we look at things such as rainfall, temperature, forest cover, have previously been used to determine the conditions that are favorable for uh, ticks that serve really as proxies for uh, the public health threat imposed by Lyme and other tick-borne pathogens. Uh, but these variables are used really without incorporating human behavioral and demographic factors into the model. And it's something that, uh, that we've been pretty diligent about trying to include as we build risk models for infection. And these factors directly govern, govern the contact uh, and transmission of infectious uh, agents. If you don't have people in the area, you have no disease, you have no human disease, okay? And if people aren't behaving in a risky way, uh, the chances of them being infected are going to be uh, relatively small. So one pillar of our research is focused on the interaction between human, social, behavioral, and demographic elements combined with environmental reservoir and vector-driven factors um, that uh, uh, contribute to an individual encountering infectious ticks in fragmented ecospaces or these microecologies as we refer to them. So this is one of the culprits. The tick alone is not the sole issue. This is the primary competent, as we call, reservoir host. 90% of the time, if this white-footed mouse is infected, it's going to pass on that infection uh, to the tick, okay? Uh, there are other hosts that will produce, uh, that are infected, but you can go down to chipmunks and squirrels, and the competency of those hosts is less than this uh, particular cute feet, uh, uh, mouse that you see here, the white-footed mouse. Um, what we do, is at sites, uh, locations where there's a lot of human activity. Um, we trap these animals, we identify them uh, by GPS, the areas that we're working in, and um, they are near high traffic walkways or other areas of high human activity, and we compare those, if you will, to areas with very low or re uh, or low human activity or remote areas just to see what's the relative degree of infection uh, of this host and of the ticks that we collect from the exact same area. So what are our results? In this animal, in a six county area that uh, we've been working, the entire upper Susquehanna River Basin, um, if we were just to look at blood, we'd find that under 2% of the blood carries the infectious agent. However, if we move to other organs, we find that bladder is very high, with about 35% um, 
and uh, other organs uh, in the 20s and 30s. So we would totally miss epidemiologically what was happening if we just took a bit of blood from these mice and not understood anything further about how the infectious agent sequesters in various organ tissues of these animals. We are also looking at how and where in various organs the agent does sequester and can we relate that to the uh, various uh, types of symptoms that we have in a study of some 200 to 250 uh, patients with post-treatment Lyme disease uh, syndrome uh, that uh, Dr. John Darcy, who's here today, um, started a few years ago. And there's more on this study. If you want to go and take a look at uh, some of the posters, there's a poster on that uh, uh, mouse com study comparing it to the symptomology, the sequestration of the organ, organism in various organs of the mouse compared to the type of symptoms that these patients have. Most of you kind of have an idea of how we collect these ticks. We use a one meter by one meter drag cloth um, over uh, various types of low-lying vegetation or leaf litter. Um, and we use a standard protocol for that. And um, we also, in the same areas, we record all of the demographics, how many people come through the area, whether they're men, women, what kind of clothing risk they have, whether they're doing things such as leaning up against a tree, reading a good book, sitting at a picnic table, etc. behaviors that increase their risk of infection. We collect these ticks from the drag when we get them and uh, put them in 70% alcohol, ethanol, and bring them to the lab and freeze them at minus 20 degrees until we're ready to work on them. So these are some of our findings on density per thousand uh, 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 square meters. You can see we find seven and a half ticks. This is a thousand square meters, not a big area, folks. Um, Mandy may have uh, uh, something which gives you an idea of the size of it in, in her talk, but um, you can see that we have variation again from county to county. But uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of ticks in the upper Susquehanna River Basin. Um, we then move on to a laboratory analysis of these ticks. We look at their life cycle stage we sex them, um, and then we emulsify them by using liquid nitrogen. So we, in this process, the idea is to try to get at the DNA. If the DNA of the infectious agents are there, that's how we get it. We disrupt this tick totally and pull out and isolate that DNA, purify it, okay, and then test it to see if it has the various infectious agents that cause Lyme, uh, Babesia, and Plasma, etc. Here are some of the results. Just here on campus, you know, we have some 18 to 20,000 students and people working here on campus in various areas. 42% uh, of the ticks are infected. Broome County, 33. 36, Delaware County, 42, 29, 29, 40, Tompkins. So there's a great deal of ticks. Notice that the nymphs are maybe about half that on average, okay? That's because the adults have taken an extra blood meal and therefore have an extra chance of becoming infected. So they have twice the chance of being infected. Okay. Here's the density of infected nymphs. This is the acrological risk. This 
is a high risk of infection, as you see at the bottom of the screen, is 0.3. You can see that in almost every case, except two, I think, on there, we're at very high risk of infection from Lyme in our area, in this six county upper Susquehanna River Basin. What do we do with all of this stuff? Well, over the past several years, we've attempted to mathematically model uh, the risk of Lyme, and we've recently published our initial attempt in the uh, journal Royal Society Open Science. And one of the interesting things that we reported in this article was the effect of interventions. So we tried to model, we put all of the data that I've shown you, plus a whole lot more, into uh, uh, using system science approach into developing this risk model. And uh, we then took a bunch of interventions. So the first uh, um, intervention um, was um, looking at um, doubling awareness, okay? Uh, second one was decreasing clothing risk. Intervention three was uh, getting rid of all the white-footed mice. Many of you have thought about how you're going to get rid of ticks, how you might you get rid of the reservoir host, the mouse, and what effect. The only interventions that work, okay, are awareness, increasing awareness. And th that's the two curves uh, that uh, show the decrease from 2016 to 2020 that we projected. So if you make people aware and you reinforce that awareness, that will decrease the risk of Lyme. Not getting rid of uh, the mice, not doing the other interventions that, uh, that I mentioned. This is a new project. We just started this project last year. We have some preliminary results. Um, it's called the Neighborhood Project, um, and it's in the Triple Cities area here. So we're in the urban, peri-urban environment. We're in neighborhoods, people's backyards. And I'm gonna show you some of the results. We just started with 97 households. Um, in May to November of 2017. We actually worked during the nymph season, during the summer, and the houses that were negative during the summer, we went back in the fall and found that they were not negative. We picked up adult ticks from those areas, okay? So, some of the preliminary uh, data. Infectivity of the nymphs, 32% of adults was a lot lower to our surprise at 23% in the density of infected nymphs. This is our people's backyards. Okay, we're um, almost 0.5 and 0.3 is high risk. Okay. Here's a little bit of an uh, 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 kind of a circular diagram to give you an idea. Um, property refers to the property perimeter. So. We went around the perimeter of each of these households. Uh, we covered 44% of, uh, 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 of what we covered was in that perimeter. Vegetation, we covered 6% of all of the area that we dragged. The lawn was 37%. And right around the house itself, right at the margin of the house, about 30%, um, 13%, sorry. Here's uh, percentage of ticks that we found by spatial distribution. So on the perimeter of the property, 47%. On the vegetation, 42%. About 8% of all the ticks we collected was in the lawn, and 3% of the ticks were right exactly around the house edge. So moving forward, what do we hope to do with the neighborhood project? We want to significantly expand it, maybe to 500 households in this area. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Part of it depends on funding, but we would uh, like to do that in Broome County. We'd like to expand it uh, if we have um, the funding throughout the Upper Susquehanna River Basin. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> we also want to take, if we can, and use what is called geospatial videoing. That is, we would hook video cameras on the side of a moving vehicle and annotate as we went through a neighborhood looking for risk characteristics. The other thing that we would do if we can, and I'm working with some folks here on campus, is to use drones where we'd have a view above the neighborhood. We'd be able to identify all of the vegetation in the area, in people's backyards, get an idea. We would already have the ticks, counts, and numbers from these areas put that together with these other factors and see if we can come up with a risk assessment and figure out what are the hot spots and why it's happening. That's our goal. Well, some of you ask about the role of deer. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about deer and the role that they play. Um, they act as spatial distributors of ticks. And they certainly have a reasonable home range, as we call it, where they roam and browse. Um, they also act as a primary breeding site for adult ticks in the fall. Okay? They're constantly in the brush, obviously. These adult ticks are uh, uh, questing, so they attach to these deer. Uh, they mate on the deer in the fall. Uh, and uh, start the next uh, part, uh, the next generation life cycle. They do not seem to play a role directly in transmission of the infectious agent, okay? Our data shows that they actually have an immune system that'll clear the infection, okay? So they, but it doesn't make any difference at mating time because those ticks once they're on that deer, they're not going to be biting you or your pets uh, or any other animals. They're going to complete their life cycle there. Um, if they, if nymphs were on the deer, they deer, from what our data shows, would actually clear the infection from those ticks. So they can help a little bit in that side of it, but they are clearly the distributors and they provide a breeding ground, okay, for these ticks. A little bit about the data. How do we know that? Um, we found about 38% infectivity with Broome and Shenango County combined. When we looked at the ticks on the deer, uh, only 2% of the ticks well, were infected between 2 and 6% uh, on average, depending on the county. Um, no attached ticks on the deer were positive. None. Okay? So it's clearing the infection. Another ongoing study we have. Okay? Of 362 bloods that we've tested so far, from a population of some 550 dogs that came to a veterinary hospital in our region um, for various reasons, not for Lyme disease, for various reasons. So we're looking at an entire population over the course of a year in a veterinary hospital of every dog that came in, if you will, uh, 500 or so, not, not, not everyone, but a sample of that. One third of all of these dogs tested positive. They had the organism. They had the Lyme pathogen, the spirochete. Okay. So, what does this tell you? Well, if you're in close contact with your pets, all right, you got to be careful because they're going, you're going to find ticks on them. If they hop up on the bed. You're going to find ticks in your bed. Okay. They're not just going to attach to that dog or cat. You have to be aware. And if you find ticks on your pets, they're acting as sentinels. You should know that you have a problem 
in your yard or wherever your animals are roaming. Okay? It should alert you. Don't ignore it. So, what can you do? You can minimize risk. And as I showed you earlier, that plays a significant role in decreasing your risk of infection. Overall awareness, situational awareness, understanding where kin tick contact may occur, using appropriate uh, prevention strategies. So, where are we going from here? We have in mind at this point, and we have some efforts underway, and we propose a new tick-borne illness center here at Binghamton. I don't know whether we're going to be able to achieve it, but we propose it. We have some grants that we've uh, uh, written to help support it. It covers some, at the moment, some 17 to 20 faculty across three different schools in the um, university and some six or eight um, um, departments. We also have several other SUNY schools, including Upstate uh, Medical involved, SUNY Groom, SUNY Delhi, and soon some other um, SUNY schools we have with us um, uh, joining into the venture. Um, um, the uh, United Hospital System, UHS, and there are 28 hospitals and clinics associated with them. So we're at least on the move towards that goal. What are the pillars of what we're going to do? We're going to continue doing the ecology, epidemiology, and risk modeling. We're going to add uh, er the development of early diagnostic tests and uh, effective treatment. The new School of Pharmacy is starting up here in the fall, and uh, we're working with them uh, as well, and of course a big part or one of the pillars of what we do is public health um, education and, uh, and outreach. So what are we aiming to do? Um, we really, uh, uh, I've covered pretty much most of that, but we want to work with public health departments. Um, once we develop these risk models, et cetera, be able to transfer that information, maybe develop some sort of an algorithm, something that will allow them just not to spend all of the years of work that we've done, but to plug in a few numbers, if you will, to come up with a risk assessment. Uh, uh, and, and we might be able to, uh, to achieve that. Um, so, This is what we're doing currently. We've got 21 new projects proposed uh, by these faculty. Uh, we already have the education and outreach arms, uh, not just this conference that we're doing with Southern Tier Line Support Incorporated, but uh, we do have uh, um, other Lyme seminars that we give, adult education, lyceum courses. We work with K through 12. So we have elementary middle schools. Mandy Rome's been uh, highly active in assisting um, with uh, school programs associated with Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses. We, uh, we just recently came back from Albany where Mandy and I were uh, uh, training teachers in a workshop. So we have science teachers. We previously trained them here at Binghamton University where they come in and uh, uh, are interested in learning about Lyme and effectively teaching it in their science classes, et cetera. So what's our predictions for the future of Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses? Well, it's here to stay. Uh, you have to deal with it. The prevalence of Lyme will increase. It will become more widespread and co-infections will definitely increase. And we're beginning to see that in our area here. We're looking at anaplasma and babesia. I don't have any numbers for you right now, uh, but we're working on between 500 and 1,000 ticks at this point 
uh, in time and we'll have some results uh, in the near future. Um, but it's really not bleak future uh, with advances in medical research, with the potential of a vaccine for Lyme. I didn't say a vaccine for the other um, uh, co-infections that you have, but probably one for Lyme will be not too distant. Uh, I don't have any inside information on that. New York State and the federal government are now beginning to pay a lot of attention to the problem. There's actually a working group in Congress, and there's some bills being written right now uh, associated with it, and there are subcommittees that are associated with this working group that uh, my understanding is uh, they're gathering all of the research information over the next two years to be able to come up with uh, uh, information which will spawn some research funding, we hope, uh, and uh, other applications for funding from the federal government. And New York State is doing the same. But awareness and education, with awareness and education, the uh, incidence of Lyme related for illnesses will uh, decrease. Um, if you're interested in participating, and I've had some folks come up and uh, talk to me, if you're a patient, if you're a researcher, if you're in a hospital, a physician, uh, and you're interested in the proposed center, uh, come and talk to me. If you're interested in participating in the neighborhood project, uh, contact me. We'll try to uh, uh, give you the latest information, get you enrolled if, uh, if we're uh, 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 going to be starting potentially this uh, summer. And part of what we do, of course, is um, uh, uh, train students here both undergraduate and graduate students. They're a big part of our program. They've just come back from national scientific conferences, uh, and uh, they've been presenting some of the results on uh, Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses. And I'll just, and this is just part of our team. Uh, the team continues to change through time. At any given time, we might have uh, about 50 undergraduate students and. Uh, anywhere between five, we've had as many as 10 graduate students working on the project uh, with us. And uh, I'll end here and uh, take any questions you might have. One of the things that I noted is that um, in the areas that you um, dragged, that you found that the adults were less infected than the nymphal ticks, which is really unusual, other than like in California where they've had the right. fence lizards. So um, my thought is, how about taking a look at what is in that environment? Um, do they have a different mix of animals? Do they have more opossums? Do they have more deer? Just what is it that is making that uh, occur? Are there some other natural enemies? For instance, we know that wolf spiders reduce um, ticks. Um, and, and which would drive down Lyme disease. So I'm wondering if you had any plans in trying to figure out what is causing that. Yeah, first of all, uh, our results are just the opposite of that, except for the neighborhood project. That's where, you, that's, where, that's where you saw that. I think part of that is just probably on the basis of sampling. We'll know more this year whether that holds. If it does hold, let's assume you're correct and it does hold, then yes, we need to figure out why adults would have that much less of, a, of, of, of an impact uh, in terms of being infected. They should be double, um, approximately, double that of nymphal ticks. Okay? Uh, one quick one. Yes, uh, wild turkeys. She said she understands that they feed on ticks. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, birds will pick insects and ticks, and turkeys, I'm sure, will uh, opportunistically feed, particularly the young uh, uh, pullets, et cetera, chicks. Uh, but uh, I, 
I don't know to what extent they have an impact, okay? I can't answer that at the moment. So Dr. Osfeld did research on turkeys and he found that they were a net sum game. Okay. Guinea hens, turkeys, all good. <laughs>